Hello all, Rick here and this video is about the various life support systems in Starfleet vessels as well as the variations that exist due to the differing requirements of multiple species. In real world systems, oxygen is recycled from carbon dioxide creating about 40% of the required amount and removing the build up of CO2. The air is cycled through numerous filters that remove the trace elements such as methane and electrolysis extracts the extra O2 from the water. The hydrogen from the H2O is also combined with the waste carbon dioxide to create even more water and methane. In many ways this chemistry is continued into Star Trek, but things get far more efficient when you can create molecules at an atomic level via replication and transporters. There's a bit of a stereotype among the other species of the Star Trek universe levelled against the Federation and its approach to starship design, and that is that Starfleet vessels tend to have too many redundancies and backups upon backups. This is not an idle observation to be honest, Starfleet vessels do have a lot of backup systems, but where the jokes originate is that frequently whatever issue knocks out a subsystem is usually enough of a problem to also nullify the backup options too. This has led species like the Klingons to look at Starfleet ships as over designed and in some cases they have a point. But not when it comes to life support. Technically a standard Federation vessel has its life support system built to a standard set by the Federation Regulatory Agency. Section 102.19 to be exact. This dictates that every Starfleet vessel have no less than three life support systems to maintain its atmosphere. Technically that's a bit of a cheat, as two of those systems actually operate in rotation at all times, while the third is the true backup system. And many ships even have localised reserves for extensive damage, so four systems if you want to be picky. The internal atmosphere of a Federation starship is set to the average N-class environment, one tolerable and for the most part comfortable to most humanoid species, which make up the majority of the Milky Way's people, be they Betazoid or Bolian. This M-class environment is set to 26 degrees Celsius, 45% humidity, pressure at 101 kilopascals, with an oxygen-nitrogen mix and a standard gravity of 1g. This might be slightly on the warm side for some, or a bit too humid, but overall acclimatisation is possible. However, there are occasionally Starfleet vessels which are crewed entirely by another species, or members of the same species, such as the Vulcan ships, the USS Intrepid in 2268 and the Tucumbra in 2375. These vessels would have internal life support tailored to those crews, probably slightly hotter and with less humidity to resemble the arid air of Vulcan, but still well within M-class ranges. Minor tweaks to life support could be made at a ship-wide level, allowing for the dispersal of different compounds as well as alterations to heating, but more extensive overhauls had to be conducted at a starbase or dry dock. Internally, individual quarters too had much wider ranges of environmental control than the operational sectors of the ship. The main life support systems consist of alternating air processors every 50 metres around the halls of a starship that withdraw carbon dioxide from the air and replace it with fresh oxygen using photosynthetic bioprocessors. Every 96 hours, the life support system switches over from one active system to the other, allowing for maintenance on the inactive one. The gravity plating lines every floor surface of a ship and can be altered for various needs. The entire net is powered by the artificial gravity generator, which produces gravitons to generate the sensation of Earth normal gravity. The gravity plating has a dedicated network to every deck and section, so failures usually don't cascade throughout the entire ship. Without it, the crew would simply float or need to use magnetic boots. The backup life support only operates at 50% the efficiency of the full life support and can last for a day, running off main or emergency power. However, 
if the backups then fail, there are numerous 30-minute stores of atmospheric mix that can be deployed into corridors located throughout the vessel. These are designed to pressurise rooms that have been removed from the main life support supply, usually due to damage. Alongside these, there are designated shelter areas that have greater emergency reserves, however these cannot support everyone, so harsh choices would have to be made. Alongside all this, the standard lighting in an emergency drops to a dimmer level to conserve every minute of available power. As for waste, well the carbon dioxide that is recycled along other, uh, stuff, poop, I mean space poop, it's added to a variety of recycling systems. Some matter can be used as fertiliser for hydroponics and as CO2 for plant life. Other materials, around 5% of the produced amounts, are broken down by dematerialisation and used for replication matter. However, it should be noted that there is some waste that is actually more energy effective to simply process or dispose of in less technologically savvy ways. Overall, around 82% of waste matter is reused on a Federation starship. Not every species can survive in an M-Class environment, and unfortunately for these individuals, they often have to wear their own life support gear. In Starfleet, there are several of these races, such as the Benzites, which as of 2364 were not a Federation world, but one strongly tied to them. Most early Benzites that joined Starfleet wore a respirator apparatus attached to their chest that secreted a chlorine-rich atmosphere that was breathable for them. They could breathe in standard oxygen-nitrogen for a while, but this would cause lung damage. This is the inverse of most humanoids who can tolerate very low levels of inhaled chlorine, up to about 30 parts per million. Higher concentrations, however, result in acute respiratory damage. Because of this hazard to others, there must have been some projected force field from a benzite's appliance to prevent the gas from dispersing too far and within the breather's proximity. Soon, however, the benzites developed an alternative to this visible respirator, although I could not find any canon explanation as to what this alternative was. It could be an internal chlorinator in the air passages, or some form of nanotech. As they are not a Federation race, this might even be genetic modification of some sort. Another species, the Barzan, also were not Federation members but occasionally had dealings with Starfleet or the UFP. This was out of necessity, as their homeworld of Barzan 2 was not very rich in resources, and they engaged in trade with others to offset this. The exact atmospheric composition of their planet was never mentioned, but it was toxic to standard humanoids. Like the Benzites, the Barzans chose to affix a respirator to their face, enabling them to breathe. However, these were actually implanted into their cheeks to alter the atmosphere they inhaled, probably as it entered the mouth. A Barzan can survive with only one of these functional, although it was difficult. The Elysians are another species with specific life support requirements. Whereas they do breathe a standard M-Class atmosphere, their planet has a very low gravitational pull and they have evolved to function just fine when in this environment, but the common 1G set by Federation standards would cripple an unprotected Elysian. As such, they wore external support frames in this environment coupled with anti-grav chairs for mobility. In all of these examples, however, a crewman assigned to a Starfleet vessel would have their quarters specifically altered to be habitable for them, so they could at least be comfortable in their own homes. Ships that frequently served as diplomatic vessels, such as Galaxy Classes, also had several guest quarters that could be set to extreme environments, including L and K class atmospheres. I have done a video breaking down Planetary Classification 2 if you're interested. Starfleet in most of these instances tends to meet other cultures halfway. Understandably, it's rather more inconvenient to convert an entire starship's artificial ecosystem to accommodate one individual with extreme requirements, but with the aid of personalised and specialised equipment, it's quite feasible to stand shoulder to shoulder with someone requiring a completely different biome. 
This approach upholds the commitment from Starfleet to allow for a variety of individuals from multiple origins to live and work in space. And if I'm sure if the Enterprise D and the USS Titan can even accommodate whales, dolphins and other aquatics as part of their crew, some small concessions can be made here and there. Unless you're a Tholian, in which case your chances of surviving on a Federation ship are very low considering you'd freeze, fracture and shatter in an M-Class atmosphere. Explosively. Thanks for watching this video on the various life support systems present on a Starfleet craft and the numerous redundancies and personal alterations that can be made. Can you think of other species from primary or extra canonical stories that had their own life support requirements? I thought of the Tagrens, but their breathers were due to damage inflicted by their own pollution and they didn't serve in Starfleet. So until the next tech lore discussion or review video, I've been Rick and I'll see you again next time. Goodbye.